Hi and welcome back to the Girl Gone London channel. If you're new here, my name is Kaylin. I'm a dual UK and American citizen and today we are discovering 11 obscure differences between the UK and the USA. These are all things I've collected over the months in my phone, on my notes app, because this is honestly the sort of stuff that keeps me up until 3 a.m. Um, some of them do deserve a deeper dive in the future, but this video is for all of you who are like, Kaylin, you're great but I have the attention span of a goldfish and do not need a 20 minute video on why the US calendar starts on a Sunday and why the UK calendar starts on a Monday. So for all of my goldfish out there, here we go, rapid fire obscure differences. Also one thing, I know this is like relatively pointless in the grand scheme of life, but I'm on my way to 20,000 subscribers and it would be really fun to hit that. So if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider doing so you're not going to get much out of it besides the satisfaction of helping someone else and you're probably going to see my videos come up in your feed a little bit easier um so take that into consideration but if you are so inclined please hit the subscribe button okay difference one let's just start with it because i've already spoiled it if you look at a calendar in the USA, it will have the week usually starting on a Sunday, but if you look at one in the UK, it will often have the week starting on a Monday. The calendar that starts out on a Sunday and ends with Saturday is based on the idea that the seventh day of the week is the day of rest and the original Sabbath day in the Judeo-Christian system was Saturday. However, the current international standard and the one that the UK now follows um, in their formatting is that Monday is the first day of the week with Sunday being the last one, not the first one. The UK actually did have a history at one point of starting the calendar on a Sunday, so it's not entirely without precedent in the UK, but things changed. And one major argument for Sunday coming last is that it's part of the weekend, the end of the week, which by definition should come at the end of the calendar. So what do we think? Internet is Sunday or Monday the start of the week? Being American, I definitely still think of Sunday as the start of the week. And when I use calendars that I can manipulate, like digital calendars, I always have mine starting on a Sunday. Difference two, cowpole. If you're British and I say cowpole, you'll know exactly what I mean. It's a brand of children's medication that is essentially a low dose of paracetamol called acetaminophen in the US. It's considered an important part of any parent's medicine cabinet here in the UK. If you're American and I say cowpole, you will have no idea what I mean because it's not a brand we use in the US. Our equivalent is called children's Tylenol. Tylenol is our major brand of the generic drug paracetamol or a, a, I can never say this, acetaminophen, acetaminophen. Um, so the children's version of Tylenol is just the version with a lower dose designed for a children's body similar to cowpole. But if you are British and you are on holiday or vacation in the US and you're looking for something like cowpole, now you know, don't ask for cowpole, ask for children's Tylenol. Difference number three is the pronunciation of this place. I've mentioned this before and we will do a linguistics deep dive at some point, but today is not that day. But I'm always fascinated by how Brits pronounce the O in places like this. So in the UK, it sounds like Barbados. In the US, we would say Barbados. While researching this video, I did find an entire blog post of a woman who discovers this difference and is mocked by her English colleagues. And she gets really into the investigation of these differences but it was a lot of phonics chat for me to get through on a Friday. So just know that we do say the O differently, similar to how many Americans would say Costa Rica, like Costa Rica, and many Brits would actually say Costa Rica. So this difference in how we pronounce the O, again, very interesting, but this is a rapid fire. So we're going to move on, but if you want to leave your phonics information below, please do. Okay. Difference number four has to do with Formula One. So Formula One is a popular racing sport in the UK and most of Europe. Interestingly, prior to the recent Netflix show that came out about Formula One, most Americans not only did not follow Formula One, but probably had never heard of it. The US has always preferred NASCAR with big races like the Daytona 500 being well watched and attended. 
The UK, on the other hand, has for many years had Formula One as the top racing sports top racing sport Brits would follow. Um, and most Brits would not follow NASCAR because why would you? It's a pretty American thing. But Formula One is growing in the US recently due to the Netflix show. The latest US Formula One Grand Prix was the highest ever attended. And there's a lot of anecdotal evidence online that Americans who watch the Formula One Netflix special are now into it. I found comments that, that say things like, I don't know anyone who was born in the USA who watched Formula One before the Netflix show, but everyone who watched the Netflix show watches Formula One now. Will the sport continue to gain a following in the US or will it just be a fad? Time will tell, but it's an interesting difference. Difference number five, this word. This one was brought about by a specific moment talking to my British husband, probably like 10 years into our relationship when somehow we were talking about like cows or horses or Western movies or something. And he pronounced this word lasso. And I looked at him and I was like, what did you say? And he repeated it. And I said, are we talking about the same thing right now? I'm genuinely curious what you're saying. And he repeated it again. And he said, what would you say? And I said, I would say lasso. And I realized in that moment that Brits and Americans say this word differently. So again, he said it and many Brits would say it lasso. I would say it lasso. The best information I could find on the origin of the lasso was that it does have a history of being used by Native Americans before Europeans even got to the New World. So I don't usually pick sides, but I'm going to say that I think the pronunciation of the word as lasso just sounds much better and much more cowboy to me. Whereas lasso sounds too nice and proper. Like it's like if you were taking a cowboy out to afternoon tea rather than like an afternoon of actually like lassoing things. Um, but this is, this is one of these obscure differences because you can visit the UK, you can live here for a couple years, but I swear it wasn't until I was here for like seven or eight years that I had any need to find out how other people said this word. So that was difference number five. Difference number six, sledding versus sledging. The thing you do in the winter when it snows and you take like a piece of plastic and you throw yourself down a hill. Americans typically call this sledding and Brits tend to call it sledging. Difference number seven is hay fever versus seasonal allergies. This is an interesting one for any of you who tend to suffer from pollen counts throughout the year. I had never heard of hay fever before moving to the UK. I'm not saying no one in the US calls it that, but certainly no one in my circle ever did. We would simply call them allergies or we would call them seasonal allergies to differentiate between something like a pet allergy. My internet research on this one tended to agree with my experience. I found that both countries do use both terms, but it did tend to be more commonly seen that in the UK, it was more often referred to as hay fever, whereas in the US, it was more often referred to as seasonal allergies or just allergies. Difference eight has to do with summer camp. Have you ever seen the American version of summer camp in a video like Parent Trap or Heavyweights? There's this idea that parents will send their kid off for a solid like four to eight weeks to go live in a cabin in the woods with camp counselors and they have a flagpole and a dining hall and arts and crafts and a lake and all of that iconic American summer camp fun. Yes, this is an actual thing. It is a pretty realistic depiction. It does exist. And American sleepaway camp is an important part of many American children's childhood experiences, particularly in certain parts of the country. This does not mean that every American child goes to residential summer camp. I never went as a kid to a sleepaway camp um, for that long, but I did work at one for three summers. So the compare and contrast here is that in the UK, day camps do exist for kids in the summer and on school breaks. And occasionally you might go away for a few days or a week with like the scouts or another group like that. But the idea of sending your kid away for like months at a time to some idyllic cabin in the woods does not exist. The reasons are many, but one easy answer logistically is that the UK summer break is only about six weeks long and families do want to also travel with their kids or do things with their kids. So compared to America, while some kids will have a full two and a half to three months off for summer, there isn't really time in the UK to send your kids to a long residential camp while still doing other things. Also, 
Parents in the UK will have more annual leave or vacation days than in the US. Many American parents will only have one or two weeks off in the year at most, while Brits already have about four weeks of mandated vacation time, and that's if their employer doesn't offer more. So uh, they would have more time to take off to spend with their kids during those summer breaks. You could also look at things like potentially weather being a factor, but in general, summer camp in the American sense of the word is not culturally relevant in the UK, though there is a program called Camp America where university age students get to be camp counselors at various summer camps across the US to get that experience in a different way. Difference nine is lead versus leash. The thing that you walk your dog with, Americans call it a leash, while Brits tend to call it a lead. Difference 10 is dish soap versus washing up liquid. It's our final language difference, and it's that Brits tend to call this washing up liquids, while the Americans would call it dish soap. This probably stems from the fact that Brits call it doing the washing up, as in you cooked, so I'll do the washing up, whereas Americans wouldn't call it the washing up. They would just call it doing the dishes. Difference 11 uh, has to do with Netflix shows. So I mentioned Netflix earlier when talking about Formula One, but one interesting thing that a lot of people wouldn't even think about unless you live a dual country life is that UK Netflix and US Netflix have different rights to different movies and shows. So even if you have your same Netflix account, if you try to access it in the UK versus the US, you'll have different options available to watch. A lot are the same, of course, but there are some big notable shows like Friends and The Big Bang Theory that are on UK Netflix but not US Netflix, and similarly there are a lot of things that are on US Netflix that do not appear on UK Netflix, and this isn't even down to the audience demand necessarily but it's down to which streaming service owns the rights in that country. And the rules are based off which country you're watching in, not which country your account address is in. So if you sign up in the UK, you're a UK citizen, UK resident, and you take your laptop on vacation to America and try to log in to your Netflix account, you might find that you can't watch the same shows you were in the middle of while in the UK. And as soon as you get back to the UK, they'll suddenly appear again. This brings me to the end of today's video. I hope you learned at least one new thing today. If you made it all the way to the end of the video, let me know in the comments by giving me your most interesting fact that you know. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.